At BECO, we believe that healthy living is only possible with a healthy planet. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Designing the Healthy Kitchen, an MKBA summit in partnership with our friends at Beko USA, a brand committed to helping its customers enjoy a healthy lifestyle and contribute to a healthy planet. We're so excited to have over 1,300 people registered for today's summit. It shows just how important this subject is to our industry. During today's sessions, we'll be launching some interactive polls where respondents have a chance to win one of three Beko Turkish coffee makers. At the end of the summit, you also have a chance to win one of five prize packs valued at nearly $500, which include the NKBA Luxury Kitchen Coffee Table Book, two bash tickets at KBiz, two opening party tickets at KBiz, printouts of the Healthy Kitchen Summit recipes, and one sheet of new Beko products. Just remember, you have to be present to win. In addition to Summit, with all the presentations, will be available on demand by the end of next week. So no worries if you're taking notes and, and just can't keep up, we've got you covered. This afternoon, we'll be hearing from designers, food and product experts, and healthy living advocates who will be discovering and discussing how a healthful approach to our daily routines dramatically changed during the last two years has transformed how we think about the kitchen not only about how the kitchen has evolved to become the every room where we eat, work, and learn, but also how we approach the space itself and what we put in it. The health and wellness trend started, of course, pre-pandemic, but it evolved at a much faster pace thanks to our enforced home confinement during COVID. This time at home really showed us what we needed to reassess, the kitchen and how important it was to our lives. Like many, I decided to remodel my kitchen so that it more closely reflected my family's eating habits, which we made do before the pandemic with the older kitchen. But since then, it's become a necessity to update the space. We all spend way more time in than we did before. We looked at the kitchen differently. If we were going to be cooking and dining at home most, most of the time, we wanted the space to function and support our eating preferences and not have to deal with endless frustrations. We wanted it to help us be healthier while also promoting a healthier environment. More on this later with uh, the panel that's coming up with my friend and then the Beko president, Zach Elkin. But for now, this brings us to our first panel discussion focusing on how new home buyers are making the health of themselves and the environment a priority when looking for a house. And it usually starts with the heart of the home. The kitchen. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our very own Trisha Zach, head of NKBA Research, who will be moderating this discussion. So Trisha, take it away. Thank you, Bill. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining today to listen in on our panel discussion. As Bill noted, we will be talking about the importance of health and sustainability to the emerging, aka millennial homebuyer. It's a subject that's been gaining steam for several years, but like many other things, the pandemic has intensified this shift to health and wellness, not just for us, but also for the planet. Many of us, 
but more specifically, the younger generations are viewing everything they do through this lens. With me today to talk about this trend as it pertains to design and kitchens in particular are Mary Jo Camp, owner of Design Camp, who has built a career on providing expertise to clients on how to live well and work well, and Nadia Subaran, co-founder and owner of Aiden Design, which specializes in custom kitchen and bath designs and emphasizes ergonomics and functionality. Both are also members of Becco's Healthy Kitchen Council. Welcome, Mary Jo and Nadia. Thank you, nice to be here. Thank you, great to be here too. Nice to have you. Let's dive right in. My first question goes to you both. Let's set the stage for first for this conversation by talking about who these homeowners are that are most interested in this concept of a healthy kitchen. NKBA research suggests that millennials are very interested in health and wellness and sustainability, but they aren't the only ones. Can you each tell me who your clients are who care most about this and are driving this mo movement? Mary Jo, why don't you go first? Well, yes, um, the data really shows that the millennials are interested in health and wellness, but I found that it's not just the millennials. I've got Gen Xers, I've got boomers, even seniors who, um, who are really concerned with personal health, health and wellness and also with the health of the, the, health of the planet. Um, I've got, uh, um, if you look at this, uh, this space, can you imagine a multi-generational family in this space, not only enjoying cooking together, but also enjoying their outside space? It becomes one and it offers all this space and um, counter space and equipment that they can work together. And the, the grandparents are teaching the grandkids um, how to make healthy family recipes in this space. So it works great for multi-generational uh, families, but it also works great if there's just one cook in the, in the kitchen because the space is laid out such that um, anybody can work in this space and provide health and healthy uh, food uh, meals for their family or for themselves. Thank you, Mary Jo. What about you, Nadia? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I would agree with Mary Jo that I think it is less uh, generational and more about attitudes. Um, where I do think that millennials are kind of leading the charge is in acceptance of new technologies. Um, right. So I am a huge proponent of induction cooking. And for some of my clients who have been cooking on gas for a couple of decades, you know, converting to induction can be a hard sell. Um, but not so much for my millennials, who I think are very data driven. They love to do research and the numbers don't lie, right? So induction cooking is 90 to 95% energy efficient, whereas gas is only 50 to 55%. Um, also some great opportunities um, in terms of ventilation, which in our area, uh, I'm in the Metro DC area, um, ventilation and makeup air is a really big deal. Um, so I, I would say that th that that is where millennials are leading. I do think that there is just heightened awareness, um, you know, across the board about um, how important the choices are that we make uh, in in the in the products that we buy. And I do think that folks are really interested in companies that share a greater view uh, in terms of health of the planet while providing quality products and embrace things like diversity and you know fair trade. So um, the, the, we're, we're seeing that quite a bit. Thank you. Given that millennials are at their peak home buying years and the growing number of them are seeking assistance from professional kitchen designers, we can only expect that demand for healthy kitchen design is going to continue to grow. Nadia, can you go a little deeper about the millennial buyer from a design and space perspective? Sure, sure. I, I, I would say that what we have seen is um, really a desire to create um, open spaces that connect a lot with 
their with the outdoors, as Mary Jo was saying um, earlier. I think that need, that desire to bring nature in um, it, it ha has so many benefits to um, kind of mental health, right? And just the joy that you feel when you're working in spaces. Um, less is more in terms of design details. Uh, I, I think we're seeing a lot more kind of streamline modern sensibilities, um, a, a, a reemergence of um, the love of natural materials for sure. Uh, so um, we're we're seeing a lot of that, and I think it is where where we're seeing that that trend solidify is that this is the way that most families now want to live, right? They wanna live in a connected, open, um, engaging space. So that, that's what we're seeing. Thank you. So walk me through how this actually works. Are your clients coming to you listing the healthy, sustainable elements that they would like, or are you having to ask them and make recommendations? Mary Jo, you wanna take a stab at this one first? Well, I think some of my clients are really um, adamant about certain healthy aspects in the kitchen, but basically with all my clients, I have a, a dialogue with my clients about what their needs and priorities are. And that usually shows up um, with um, uh, how their lifestyle works and how they wanna support that lifestyle within their space. Um, we then discuss layouts and, and materials and appliances and other products that um, that they would be interested in fulfilling those needs. So we work out this combination together. Some people have um, very strong preferences. Some people need to be led into understanding how these materials are going to work best for them. Um, which ones um, have the highest cleanability? Why? Why, as Nadia was talking about, the details, fewer details make it easier, not just to live with for a long time, but, but easier to clean as well. And so um, it's, it's, a, it's a group discussion that I have with them. And I take lots of notes and, and make sure that I'm covering their main priorities. And everybody's main priority is to be healthy, whether they know they wanna be healthy cooks or not. Um, everybody has a priority to be healthy. So that always comes up in the discussion. Thank you, Mary Jo. Nadia, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so we have a very specific process where all of our potential clients fill out a three-page um, online customer survey. And we ask a lot of very specific questions, some relative to ergonomics. Are you right-handed or left-handed? How tall are you? How many folks work in the kitchen? Um, and then we, we ask a lot of lifestyle-related questions. How often do you cook at home when you entertain? How many folks? You know, uh, a, a big section for wish list. So um, people have no problem filling that out, all the things that they would love <laughs> to have. So the challenge is ours to try and make all of that fit. And then, you know, I, I feel like my job as a kitchen designer is to let people know about what is out there. I am not pushing anything on any of my clients, but I do want them to know about newest technologies. And so there is a bit of homework that we have all of our clients do, especially relative to appliances. So I want folks to know about induction cooking, steam ovens, modular refrigeration. They don't have to choose any of these things, but we want them to know what the benefits are um, in terms of design, in terms of health and technology. Um, um, and then, um, and then it's yeah, very much, very much a back and forth uh, in in terms of trying to prioritize what those priorities are. Thank you. So I suppose the most obvious purpose for a healthy kitchen is to provide homeowners a place to store and prepare their food. So Mary Jo, what specific design design elements support a client who is interested in clean eating and healthy cooking? Well, as we saw in last, that last image, it's important that the balance of storage and openness and counter space is achieved and that the storage is convenient uh, to the workspace. So choosing refrigeration that has the technology to keep um, food, fruits and vegetables fresh and also um, healthful uh, longer 
is, is really a great choice for most of my clients. Um, but also keeping storage accessible to the counter space when they're working is very important. Here you see refrigeration and behind that, that sliding door is, is a full pantry. So the pantry can store dry goods. So we've, when we come in from grocery, we've got it all there together, making life a little easier, um, even before preparing that healthy food. Within that uh, pantry is also a freezer because we see a lot of people now who are, who are prepping their canning. They're bringing in their vegetables from, from home gardens and canning or freezing what they're not using right away. And so, um, I think that storage is really important, but it's also got to be balanced. You've got to have, you can't just have big equipment and have no counter space, no place to work. So that balance of the right materials, the right work centers and storage being, being there. Now, storage is, always has to be balanced off between those wide open spaces. As you saw looking out into this kitchen in the first shot, you know, there's some great outdoors there and people wanted that wide open so that their, their, um, their uh, patio and their kitchen become one space. But then again, you have to close it up. But you can see here where there's storage, where it's needed, and there's openness where people wanted it. So um, right here, um, we're looking out. I live on a big lake, so most of the scenes that we see are of the big lake. But if people can't live on the lake, they want to have lots of lots of uh, fresh greenery out there. So um, in this case, this, this image shows that it's a little workstation that's not quite the main kitchen. It's got um, refrigeration. So when you're outside, maybe, you know, this is an enhancement to the outside kitchen, you know, the barbecues outside, but we've got refrigeration inside. So things are kept, you know, clean and close by, um, but can be utilized for the outside kitchen. So it's a combination of really having the right equipment, the right appliances that will do the right work and putting them in the right place with the balance of the other materials that make healthy food easier to manufacture. I think we see questions coming in from the audience, but we're running out of time. So I'm just gonna throw a quick one to Nadia and, and it is this, diet and fitness trends come and go. What makes you think this latest health or healthy kitchen movement is more permanent? So I think we, we design more for lifestyles, I think. And so, you know, one of the things that um, has become really popular for us in design is kind of creating these spaces that we refer to as breakfast bar areas. Um, and so it's wonderful. I have a lot of clients that are really big into juicing or they make smoothies on a regular basis. And so we're creating these autonomous spaces that can function and work for that. And then in entertaining moments, convert to, you know, an evening bar, right? Um, which I think would be uh, terrific. So I do think it's all about designing for versatility. We always defer to designing for everyday needs first and foremost, but then look to see how spaces can convert when you're doing, you know, that entertaining that none of us have been able to do the way we have wanted to the last few years, but are all hoping that we can get back to it. Well, I have actually room for one more. So we're going to squeeze it in. It's going to go to Mary Jo. It used to be that appliance decisions were made with home resale value in mind. If designers, builders, and others are now selecting appliances based on health, wellness, and other lifestyle benefits, how might that impact resale? Well, it, of course, resale is always important. We These large investments that people are putting into their homes, they've got to consider what would happen if they resold um, their property and moved on to something else. So I feel like if the appliances were chosen thoughtfully for the right space and with the right technology in them, um, that it enhances the resale more than just maybe choosing appliances for a brand name or some other, some other reason. So Again, it's that balance. If that kitchen works well, if that kitchen is working well for, um, for the family that's there, if it's been designed purposely and all the elements 
work together as a whole, that resale is going to stay there. And like I said before, everybody wants to be healthy. So for me, a healthy kitchen, a healthy kitchen design is the epitome of great kitchen design. And that will enhance the resale. Nadia, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I would agree a little bit with Mary Jo there. I think folks are moving away from um, choosing appliances strictly based on name brand. I think it's really about finding the appliances that fit the need um, and that are the most energy efficient. I, I, I think that's been, um, uh, we, we've seen that time and time again with our clients really wanting to know um, what the energy efficiency is and looking at the components that fit the design more so than brand. Well, thank you both. That's all we have time for today. This was a wonderful discussion and so full of useful information that I know our audience is going to watch the session again when it's available on demand. So thank you and back thank to you. Bill. Great, thank you, Trisha. Thanks much. Thank you, Tricia, and, and thank you, Nadia and Mary Jo. Fab, fabulous insight. I really enjoyed the discussion. I, I just love hearing how you know, the environment um, has grown to be such an important part of the design process with your clients. We now have our first poll of the day. Answer the poll and you'll be entered into a drawing for a chance to win a Beko Turkish coffee maker. Very, very cool. We'll announce our winner later in the summit and you do have to be present to win. So the question is, how often does a client mention health and wellness as a kitchen design criteria? Almost always, about half the time, occasionally or never. Let's see what everybody has to say. Looks like occasionally. So uh, it, interesting how, uh, how Nadia and Mary Jo shared how they talk about this with their clients, some who direct them and some who uh, just have questions or some that they initiate. Uh, so interesting, it, it is occasionally by popularity. Okay, I'd now like to introduce our next session, which is near and dear to my heart, Kitchen Design as a Source of a Healthier, More Sustainable Life. It's also a session where I get to chat with one of my favorite people. Healthy living is something that I've been passionate about for really over 30 years. Most of that time, though, I, my family and I were focused mostly on fitness. But about three years ago, my wife and I changed our diet uh, in a fairly dramatic way and uh, that of our three boys as well to incorporate this into our daily lives, including recently remodeling our kitchen. So it's easier to prep and cook and, and really just eat healthier. I'm really excited about this topic personally. Joining me for this conversation is my good friend and industry veteran, Zach Elkin, president of Beko USA. For this session, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and direct them to either Zach or myself. We will review them and answer them uh, within the next week. Welcome, Zach. Hey, Bill. Happy New Year to you and everyone in the audience. And thank you for uh, allowing us to chat with you today. We're really looking forward to the conversation and talking uh, with you and with uh, many of the design experts that uh, are attending today about how we feel sustainability and health and wellness can be impacted through smart kitchen design. Well, uh, you know, thanks Zach. And, and what a great opportunity this is. We never get to spend time, you know, just talking about our passion or at least not often enough health and wellness. Uh, and that leads me to my first question for you. When you reference a healthy kitchen, tell me what exactly does that mean? That's a great question. That's a question that we were asking ourselves about a year and a half ago. And uh, it's amazing what you can do when you listen. And so what we did is we brought together people, we brought together products, and we brought together different partnerships, if you will, with this big idea about how can we have this intersection between personal and planetary health? And, and how could we bring that to life to the uh, American consumer? And uh, so that's kind of where we're at today from a, from a brand development perspective. Makes sense. When it comes to like the design specifically, does this have a major impact, you know, on the layout, lighting, space allocation, those types of things? Oh, absolutely. You talk to any designer and they'll talk about lighting. They'll talk about haptics. They'll talk about application. Uh, you know, the cabinets off the wall, the natural light versus the, the, uh, the other. Uh, it's just, uh, 
you know, it's, it's, it's all encompassing. It's not just the home appliances that go into the kitchen. It's every aspect of it. It's, it's how much distance they have between the islands, depending on, you know, the, 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 the way the kitchen's going to be used. Uh, so no, it's, it's, it's just all encompassing. It's the food prep area, uh, if you will, uh, as, as we heard earlier uh, in the earlier conversation. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's all encompassing. It's layout, it's lighting, it's space allocation. And of course, we believe it's also home appliances. You know, it was, it was nice to catch up with you, you know, just the end of last year um, after you just joined Beco and really excited to kind of see you, you know, in a couple of weeks here at KBiz. Can you, can you talk to the audience a little bit about the vision for the brand when it comes to health and wellness? Uh, absolutely. And, and I can't wait to get to KBiz. <laughs> you know, uh, to, to actually get out into a crowd is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, certainly I'll be masked up, but I can't wait to get to it. So I'm uh, very excited about what we're going to be able to, to talk, who we're going to be able to talk to and talk about when we're there. But uh, when we talk about the, the, the healthy kitchen, we look at it as an ongoing conversation. Uh, that was the first thing we wanted to do is we wanted to listen. We wanted to listen. We wanted to learn. We wanted to make sure we understood uh, what, what was being said by designers, by home builders, by consumers, if you will. Uh, but it's, it really goes into, uh, you know, from a brand perspective, what I found extremely exciting when I first uh, had conversations with Archley, who's our parent, was when I started to understand the DNA of the company. Uh, one of the most progressive, the only appliance manufacturer that's part of the Dow 100 when it comes to sustainability, uh, carbon neutral since 2019. Uh, we don't talk about, uh, you know, energy efficiency and sustainability uh, every now and then. It's, it's part of our everyday conversations. It's everything we do. It's everything we build. So, you know, our vision is to authentically own it. And the way that we want to be able to do that is through making sure we're providing the best tools, in this case, the best appliances, if you will, when it comes to food preservation and, uh, and, and cleanability. And, and those are some of the things we're looking forward to, to showcasing at the show. I, I believe we have 35 new products we're going to be launching at the show. So we have a lot to show and most every product that we're going to be talking about and that we're going to be bringing forth, you, you will start to see how we are incorporating sustainability and how that product design is helping impact health and wellness for that new homeowner or that, that consumer that's remodeling in their kitchen. Every time we talk about this, Zach, I get more and more excited to see all this in person here in, in a couple of weeks. Um, health and wellness for you and I, you know, was very important before the pandemic and for, for many people, but certainly there seems to be a much bigger focus on it, you know, it, generally today. Do you think the emphasis has shifted or changed because of the pandemic? I think we had a, I think we had a pretty good roaring fire before the pandemic. It, a lot of it was around mental health and wellness uh, with most everything that was being built into homes, you know, quiet areas and home exercise, you know, uh, uh, sanctuaries, if you will, without phones. Uh, so health and wellness has been a, it, it's been a design trend for the last decade and most anything and everything uh, progressive architects and, and designers are doing today. I think what happened is the pandemic took a gallon of gas and threw it onto that fire because we, we were all at home you know, we're all quarantined. Uh, now our, you know, our, 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 our kitchen, or if we're lucky enough to have a home office, you know, we're, we're homebound. Uh, and as, as, as we have been, uh, I think it's really brought to life what's going on from kitchen design, from health and wellness and sustainability. I mean, I mean, just Instacart. I mean, I think I've got your best friend. Oh, one of your best friends. <laughs> I think I've got 317 trips from Instacart since March 16th of, of 2020. So, uh, no, I think it's here to stay. I'm, I don't think, I think there's a lot of Americans that might not even go back to a grocery store. Uh, but, you know, I think we talked about it, you know, 75% of the Americans are actually looking for ways to improve their health and wellness. So I don't look, for, I don't look at it as a flash in the pan or a trend. I mean, health is the new wealth. And, you know, the earlier panel you're talking about millennials are, are quick to adapt to it, but, you know, I'll call myself a boomer. Some might call me a senior. Clearly, health and wellness is extremely important to myself, my family, and my wife. As you say, I, I totally agree. I think it's not it's not a temporary thing. It's here to stay. It's, it, it was the, it was it was looming before, and it just got accelerated um, through it. Uh, can you, can you talk a little bit about food preservation? I think obviously 
related to health and wellness. Um, it's something that personally, as you know, from my lifestyle, that food preservation is important. So talk a little bit about that. Well, that's, of course, that's one of the topics that I just love and, and can't wait to uh, showcase our Harvest Fresh technology at the show this year. But uh, when you take a look at what's going on from a food waste perspective and the fact that today, I think we throw away 40% of what we grow here in the U.S. And I think the amount of food waste is the equivalent to 137 you know, million automobiles you know, on the road every day. And, and that's a real big focal point for us is from a sustainability, from a health and wellness perspective. So uh, what we find and what we've designed is uh, really state-of-the-art technology that enables the homeowner, the consumer, if you will, to be able to keep those fruits and vegetables uh, fresher for longer uh, while, they're, while they're home. Uh, and, and we do think that this is something that's very, very important uh, to consumers today is uh, how, do they, how can they minimize that food waste, uh, keep that food fresh, if you will, eat healthier. Uh, so that's how we've designed our products and are designing our products. And as I said, we have major launch uh, that we're very excited to share uh, at the show this year, where we've taken several technologies, uh, proprietary, pulled them together and brought them in the refrigerator. So we can take what we already, we already had a terrific food preservation system, but now we can take it to a new level. Exciting I know, Bill, that you, 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 you know, you talked about this earlier, but you kind of shifted your diet, right? Definitely. And, and you know, I don't know if everybody's to... aware of that or not, but uh, I remember the first time you were telling me about that. It was, I was just extremely intrigued. I think it was your mother-in-law uh, that uh, it started. Uh, it's brought it to your attention. Yeah, yeah. The, my mother-in-law started, you know, got our focus on it, and then we, you know, my wife started getting on me as far as like, well, what are we doing? And um, it was it kind of started to really disrupt our world in a way that we probably couldn't have imagined, you know, three and a half years ago. So start, you know, storing vegetables and. And, and larger islands and things were, you know, you were dealing with the kitchen that you had and, and but you were envisioning like, what would, what would it be in a perfect world? And there were things like a bigger sink, you know, when, when you do food prep and especially vegetables, you need, a, you need a lot more, you know, water and space to clean things. And, and the island, as I mentioned, you know, you wanted a big, we wanted the bigger island. So we had a lot, much more work surface. Um, and, and we wanted to be able to store more vegetables, you know, for a longer period of time. Obviously, many people, you know, that impacted their lives during COVID, just storage in general. But for us, it was really even before the pandemic, you know, around uh, how do we store vegetables. And, and, and I know also because I had the opportunity to collaborate with you, some of you were working on the kitchen, but you're, you were looking for some very specific things from an appliance perspective also that would support the way that you wanted to eat from a health and wellness perspective. Yeah, absolutely. I, I know you and I, you know, I talked about this some is, you know, steam oven, you know, my, my wife really, you know, we said, if we're going to get a new range or oven, we, we want something that, uh, you know, can use steam um, to support, you know, kind of making the food taste better, you know, uh, especially the fruits and vegetables and, and what we were cooking. Um, you know, having the combination of, of a cooktop with gas, we have propane in, in our home and, and we had that, but we wanted to also do convection um, and, and, and have that diversity, you know, with a product that had the diversity. Um, and the fridge was interesting because we had a, just bought a fridge before we made the decision to remodel and decided to keep the fridge. But now that I've learned all this from you about Beko and this blue light technology, I haven't seen it in person and I'm really excited to see it in Orlando because I think um, even though we just did our kitchen recently, <laughs> we'll probably be swapping out, you know, get looking at that Beko fridge because it's pretty exciting to, uh, to see what you all are offering there and uh, the, the ability to preserve, you know, uh, vegetables even longer. Yeah, I mean, 30 days was quite, uh, quite the accomplishment. So yeah, we've actually improved on that. Now, not that, I know you also did some things from a space perspective also if you're laying out your kitchen. Uh, to make yeah, it you know, it's interesting. And Nadia and, and, and Mary Jo were talking about some of this, you know, but even the light, like, you know, I know, you know, our designers are experts on this, not me, but when you really think about bringing natural light into a space and how much the colors that you choose uh, for cabinetry and work services um, impact that. We, we always had the same, you know, we had the same windows, but the colors were so much darker. So um, those painted cabinets from Mother Hubbard's and, and the Cosentino Quartz White countertop i mean just has made a dramatic impact on the natural light reflecting the natural light so when you combine that with with 
the functional part of what we wanted. Um, we, we you know we have our dream kitchen. We just we just love it. Hmm. Well, <clears throat> you know, we talked earlier uh, when the, when we were just getting started a little bit about the, the Healthy Kitchen Council. I know that you were interested in understanding how we uh, what we were doing to assemble that. Um, Absolutely. Very curious to know more and, and share with the audience. And, and um, again, I think it all starts with listening. It's amazing what can happen if you just listen to the market. And uh, that was the big idea was let's pull together a very diverse group for not just a design council, but a healthy kitchen council. And then the healthy kitchen council, the big idea was let's bring in nutritionists, nutritionists. Let's bring in recipe developers. Let's bring in uh, partners that have the same DNA as it relates to sustainability and health and wellness, like Dole Food Company. Uh, and of course, let's bring in uh, state-of-the-art, geographically dispersed kitchen designers from across the country. That's what we were able to do. Uh, we did it last fall. We did it in the Blue Ridge Mountains, and it was a, a three-day uh, uh, think tank session, if you will, where uh, we had different types of uh, content from from looking at trends to interactive type conversations, uh, just trying to understand, you know, what is that uh, healthy kitchen? What does it mean to, to, to the consumer, if you will? And uh, uh, out of that, uh, we were able to come up with a, a much better idea as far as definition. We still don't have a specific definition on it because I think it's going to be ever evolving. But it's the, the big idea here is, uh, how do we have healthier, uh, more sustainable lifestyles? And what does that mean to consumers? And what does that mean to the general population? And, and quite frankly, there's a high degree of personalization there. But at the end of the day, it's, it's really about, you know, the right type of design in the kitchen with the right types of products, light it in the right way, with the right workspaces, with the right lighting that you just talked about, with the right type of storage uh, that that consumer would want. That's how we kind of embody and what we think about as a healthy kitchen. Uh, and, uh, and our council members uh, uh, helped us kind of pull that together and are helping us continue to refine that as we move forward. I love hearing about all this and actually watching, you know, that video, um, it really puts a, put it, puts a mark on it, you know, what you invested in and just looking at the diversity of the group you put together. Very, very impressive. I'm sure some of your uh, competitors will be paying close attention to what you all are doing as always, Zach. Um, let, let's talk, pivot a little bit and let's talk about technology. So what, what role do you feel technology plays in, in the healthy kitchen as you define it? Uh, well, it's, it's not just technology and Wi-Fi connectivity that we're focused on, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that, and I think connectivity is here to stay, so I'm not saying anything negative about that, but the technologies that we've worked on have been food preservation uh, has been number one. Uh, cleanability uh, has been certainly number two. So uh, in refrigeration, we're going to be launching a, a, a new technology called Harvest Fresh. And Harvest Fresh takes our Everfresh technology, which is already proven to be able to keep fruits and vegetables uh, fresh for up to 30 days. Uh, and we're going to, we've made adjustments to that from a technology standpoint. And now we're going to be able to actually to trick that fruit and trick those vegetables into thinking they're still under the sun. And because of that, we're going to continue to grow vitamin A and vitamin uh, D and vitamin E. I mean, it's, it's kind of amazing and, and you got to see it to believe it. But that's one thing that we're very, very invested in as a company. The other is, is we, we're reinventing the dishwasher. Uh, the dishwasher has been going around in circles for 92 years, uh, but no longer. It won't be going around circles for, 92, uh, for the next few years. So uh, we have in, in a, a technology called Corner Sense, which allows us to do a much better job from a cleanability standpoint. And at the same time, you know, utilize 51% less water, you know, 25% less energy. So, you know, we're very, very focused on that. And, and then our, our CEO is, uh, I mean, he, 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 he lives and breathes uh, planet health and sustainability uh, every day of the week. And he's injected that within all of subsidiaries and it's within everything we do. And so we also, our laundry tubs, for example, that we'll be launching next year, I wanna say there's 60 recycled bottled water uh, in every tub liner and also a special filtering system if you will, to 
remove some of the imperfections out of the water that have been going back into uh, our, our water systems and into, into our ocean. So uh, that's really what we think about it. We have, we have 16 different thought leadership think tanks throughout the world uh, between our 28 different factories and over 3,000 patents. And, and, and it's just something that we spend a lot of time on. Uh, but it really always, always comes back to sustainability and health and wellness for Beko and the Archley brands. It's, it's definitely uh, seems like it's in your DNA. I mean, in, in what you've demonstrated here, what uh, what you talk about and, and all that we still don't even know is it's kind of you're educating everybody on, on the great aspects of the brand. Can you talk even a little bit more about sustainability and, and, and how you, you continue to focus on that in other ways? Well, I mean, all of our factories, uh, I like to say we, we're doing what everybody else is talking about, uh, because in 2019, our factories became carbon neutral. Uh, we generate our, own, generate our own power, of course, for all those plants also. Uh, uh, you know, if you take a look what's going on in the kitchen, uh, we're not the, we don't have a composting station, but there's many of them being introduced into the marketplace. And quite frankly, it ties in very well within what's happening in, into the kitchen today. Uh, I just think that, you know, the kitchen's the heart of the home. And I've always felt that the home appliance is the heartbeat of the home. Uh, so uh, I think we're just continually looking and challenging ourselves. What can we do better from a food preservation standpoint, from a complete cleanability perspective, from minimizing water usage, uh, if you will, uh, you know, we're, we're really lucky here in the United States of America because a lot of the things that, that we take for granted other, other countries don't have. So uh, I would say that it's just something that we're extremely focused on. And, you know, I would mention EPA and energy efficiency. Uh, that just, and it, that's just a starting point. Uh, you know, that just, that's just kind of gets you in the game. But clearly we're a leader there also and, and, continue, and we'll continue to maintain our leadership position there uh, with uh, EPA and energy efficiency. Uh, as we move forward. You know, Bill, you, you see sustainability uh, and you're part of many panels. I know you just got back from Mexico and Constantino and we're down there talking to uh, 500 uh, uh, different uh, design enthusiasts and, and, and folks uh, at that seminar this weekend in Mexico, where I think you said it was in the 70s. Uh, <laughs> we're jealous, by the way. Uh, yeah. But I mean, what do you see or what do you hear when it comes to planetary health and sustainability, not just in the home appliance industry, but in the, in, in, in the remodeling industry altogether. I mean, what are you hearing? Yeah, it, it was definitely warm down there, by the way. And it, it was shocking to my system to get back to the seven degree New Jersey temps uh, last night. Um, but Orlando is just around the corner, Zach. So we'll, we'll warm back up soon. Um, you know, on sustainability, um, it is an important element, no doubt, of kitchen to bath designs today. Um, you know, some designers are more passionate about it than others. And some homeowners, um, you know, especially millennials, are definitely into it. Um, when sourcing and specifying products, many designers are looking closely, I think, at two things. The sustainable elements of the product itself, uh, much that you talked about as energy efficiency, and whether these uh, the manufacturers producing products uh, are thinking about the environment. So I really can appreciate your holistic view. It's not only about the cooking, it's about the cleaning um, and it's about the commitment, you know, of the company. Uh, and I think that's, as we we've seen a lot about the millennials as consumers, they, it's not only about the product. They want to know, you know, what good have you done and what are you considering and what are you thinking about? Um, so, um, you know, the, Passionate homeowners have done their homework and, and they come to the table with a list of sustainable elements. They feel um, things in the kitchen must have, you know, dedicated recycling area, a water sense fixtures, LED lighting, um, products that are made of recycled materials, you know, coming out of the Cosentino event I was just at, um, at that company is very committed to using recycled materials. Um, so I think, I think we're going to see a lot of this with Cabe is one of the most exciting things for me We've been so focused on getting back to a live event, but the reality is your company has been thinking about 30 plus new products, you and many others. There's so much that our lives have been disrupted by. And I think, you know, Cabe is always the place to learn and understand what's happening even more so right now, because there's so much different than two years ago, you know, from what we experienced. So uh, I, I know you're going to have a big presence there. Can you tell us a little bit about the products you're going to be introducing at KBiz and, and any innovation that you're going to share? 
Oh, absolutely. And, and I couldn't agree more. I, I, I just, you know, last year was so difficult not to be able to be there and connect in person. And uh, so the opportunity to get the band back together, I, I call KBiz a, kind of a friend raising event because I get a chance to, you know, not only see on my, 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 my current and old friends, but I get a chance to make new ones. And there, there's nothing like in person. And especially when you're a very innovative company and you're launching so many new products. We have 35 new products we're going to be bringing forth at KBiz. And I can't think of a better stage to be able to do that in, quite frankly. Uh, it's just an unbelievable platform uh, and just an unbelievable opportunity. So absolutely, we're going to be bringing forth our first built-in double oven for the United States of America. We're very excited about that. It'll be the largest capacity available uh, anywhere uh, in the United States. Uh, in uh, I think I've talked with you a little bit, maybe even privately, about the dishwasher, uh, a whole new line of dishwashers that we're going to be launching, state-of-the-art innovation with what we call our corner sense technology. Uh, many of the pain points that you have in high-end premium dishwashers, cleaning filters, things of that, uh, self-cleaning filters, uh, better adjustability, better fit, fill, and finish, uh, better cl cleanability, if you will, for those niche-type items for that consumer. Uh, and again, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to talk about it. It'll be much easier to show when we're at the show. And again, that's why you have to be there. From a manufacturer, you just have to be there. Uh, you have to be there to launch your products, but also, I think, from a support standpoint for the industry. And of course, our refrigeration. And those dishwashers, by the way, we're going to launch those on Earth Day. Uh, and uh, uh, there's, there's, uh, there, there's some thought around that launch on, on Earth Day, of course, because that's such an important day to us from a brand perspective. Uh, refrigeration, uh, the summer solace is in June. And so we're picked the, the, the longest and the sunniest day of the year is when we'll be launching our new Harvest Fresh refrigeration. Again, it ties in, helps us tell that story, if you will, about this technology that we are putting together, where not only will we be able to maintain fruits and vegetables for up to 30 days. But now we're gonna also be able to continue to grow vitamins, vitamins into those fruits and vegetables, which I just think is amazing. And, and that's really the kind of technology that, that, that we're looking for and we think, that, that we think about every day is how do we, in, how do we increase the health and wellness <laughs> of, of, of our consumers? And, and at the same time with being able to maintain those fruits and vegetables for such a longer period of time, you're, you're, you're throwing so much less away. And as I said earlier, here in the U.S., we already throw away 40% of what we grow. So we're, we're very, very focused on, on those types of technologies, Bill. Well, you know, it's interesting. We, we, we've been talking about the refrigerator and obviously thinking about food and the preservation and this Harvest Fresh that you talked about. I mean, I can't wait to see. I can't, like you said, it's almost too good to believe. Like, I can't wait to see this. But the interesting thing to me, too, is this dishwasher. Like, you, you've made dishwasher interest exciting to say, wait a minute, I don't have to clean the filter. And, and we were joking earlier, I didn't know that I realized there was a filter that I had to clean. So, I mean, this is just great, great stuff. And I can't wait uh, to see it in a couple of weeks. Uh, this is so much fun, Zach. It's always fun talking with you. Um, if you have any questions to our audience, please put them in the chat. Zach or myself, we will answer these questions within the next week for you. Uh, thanks again for joining us. Uh, introducing 30 plus products in Orlando at KBiz. Zach, thank you for your commitment, your company's commitment to the show. And all of you, please don't forget, write this down, W1675, that's Becco's booth number. You're not gonna wanna miss it. Uh, and, and it really inspired me with, with our talk today, Zach. Thanks again. Uh, thank you, Bill. And thank you so much uh, for the, this, this, this great conversation and platform. Uh, can't wait to see you, Susie, Pam, and the rest of the, the, rest of the NKBA team. Uh, uh, when we're in Orlando again, and uh, can't wait to get to KBiz. So thank you so much again for this opportunity. We greatly appreciate it and uh, look forward to seeing you soon. We'll see you soon, Zach. Before we move on to our next session, I want to announce the winner of the Beko Turkish Coffee Maker. Congratulations, Veronica LeBlanc from Harper College. What a great way to start this session with a nice new coffee maker from Beko. Just remember that if you want a chance at winning the prize today, you have to answer the polls and be present to win. 
Now, next up in our schedule is a, another extremely part of the kitchen, especially in today's connected world, and an integral part of living a healthier lifestyle. The session is called Next Gen Appliances and Technologies that Promote Health and Wellness. And moderating this panel is another NKBA team member. So let me welcome Pam McNally, Vice President of Marketing for NKBA. Over to you, Pam. Thank you, Bill. I'm very happy to be here today to be talking about technology and how this, along with appliances, promotes health and wellness in the kitchen. With me here today are two experts on the subject. Scott Kohler, founder and president of Dream Kitchen Builders, who specializes in kitchen and baths and has designed and produced 500 projects over the past 32 years. And Sazi Bugai, director of marketing and product management for Becco USA, whose extensive background focuses on product development, innovation management, and market analysis. Thank you both for joining me here today. So I'm gonna dive right in, right out of the box. Scott, what do you feel is the most important tech aspect in the kitchen for today's consumers? Well, if we, if we look at the things uh, that, that we're consuming in the kitchen, and I'm gonna include time, uh, we're, we're consuming our own time, we're consuming energy to operate everything, food and water. So technology that saves us time, energy, food, and water is the most important tech in the kitchen. And you know, if you look at all these items, these these are quantifiable items. Uh, this isn't gadgetry. You know, we're we're able to say if we can save or not. And currently, the top item uh, consumers tell us is saving time. So uh, a couple examples: one, food. Uh, that is better preserved lasts longer. So that saves us trips to the grocery store. Uh, oven presets that go from steaming a fish to uh, putting a, a light broil on it to uh, moving it into uh, a warming mode with uh, some steam. So it's uh, steam assisted and it's uh, on hold as long as you want. All of that being done automatically. So uh, oven presets, uh, this is a, a really good, helpful thing for uh, putting a perfectly, perfectly cooked meal on the table. Another thing I would say, speed ovens are a great example. Zero preheat time, and, uh, and that saves us time and energy. So these, these are all uh, give us savings, and that's, I rate those as, as the highest uh, tech savings. So are your um, clients asking you for specific appliances that do save them time or are you suggesting it? Well, typically I'll talk to them about what their, their needs are and I'll do uh, an extensive survey. I use the NKBA survey form and uh, dig in to just what they're interested in. Then these things come up. They might not come up under that title, but you know they will come up, You know whatever their pain points are in the kitchen. And that's when I start that conversation. Okay. And Sazi, do you find that customers are asking? I mean, you know, Scott talked a little bit about, you know, preserving food, keeping it longer. Do you find that customers are asking for products that reduce food waste and keep food fresh longer? Hi, Pam. <clears throat> Sorry. Hi, Pam. It's great to be here. Yes. Um, what we've experienced lately, uh, consumers are really searching for what is good for them to get their um uh, fruits and vegetables, and, and not only just for their food, to extend and keep it longer, fresher. Because all of us, we hate to uh, throw a food to the garbage can. Um, it's happening very way too, much, too many times. And uh, maybe this uh, pandemic also uh, focused this um, to the consumers directly that how important it is not to throw or not, or not to keep, or keep the food fresh. So yes, and then we have seen this uh, enormous surge in our products um, uh, during the pandemic and just before the pandemic as well. So do you see this, you know, you talk about, I think um, Zach in the earlier session talked about Becco's Everfresh. Do you see an increase in interest in technology like this, um, you know, as a result of the pandemic um, and even now? Yes, and uh, this technology that we have, uh, we had um, on our products were second to none on food preservation. And this year uh, we're introducing this um, three color light and then actually simulating sun cycle inside the refrigerator, especially on bare, barely put um, fruits and vegetables will really make the difference. Um, the, you can see the video uh, playing behind and uh, also how we can keep food and fresh uh, fruits and vegetables fresh 
inside the fridge without any additives, without any, um, uh, it's, just a, it's just a technology that we developed uh, proprietary by keeping the humidity and temperature constant on duration and then taking care of that um, uh, water vapor uh, sourced by the fruits and vegetables, yes. And has your research shown that there's kind of a generational or regional interest in this type of technology or is it just across the board? You know, Pam, um, uh, this is across the board because the um, seniors would, lo would love to uh, definitely control uh, what they eat and uh, millennials, um, the conscious millennials, the newly um, weds, they love uh, also how to keep the fruits and fresh and then provide uh, fresh fruits, of, uh, fruits for their family as well. Great, thank you, Sazi. So Scott, when you're talking about kitchen design, um, how do you integrate the healthy kitchen approach into this discussion? I mean, what do they think of technology? They come into you with appliance suggestions like we asked before. I mean, how do you talk to them about this? Well, I start off talking about, you know, air, water, and food. And uh, in particular, how, to have, how you can have healthy air, water, and food. These things can all be improved with appliances. So for example, if you have a range connected to a hood, it automatically drafts grease, smoke, dirty air out of the kitchen. The cook doesn't even need to think about it. So the kitchen air is more clean and healthy. Uh, better food preservation is, is better food. Uh, water filters need to be easy to change and uh, we want customers to, to do that regularly. So, you know, when you start talking about the things that are the most basic and people want them to be the best that they can be. You know, Scott, you just said water filters. I'm with Bill. I had no idea I even had to change any of these filters. I'm just hoping that the appliance yeah. does it itself or I can get a robot that does it for me. Um, so yeah. let me ask you, are they receptive to designing a layout that's carbon neutral? We haven't really talked too much about the footprint. You know, kitchen and appliances really do take up quite a, amount, um, a big footprint when it comes to um, carbon usage. So are they, do you talk about this? Is it brought up? Is this even a factor to them? Well, you know, I, I think it's uh, actually uh, more of a, of a conversation in Europe than it is in this country. I think it's going to happen. It's going to have to happen. But uh, we might, uh, might ask Sazi that question because we're not getting, I mean, in those words, no, we're, we're not getting, at least I'm not getting that request. And Sazi, what about you? Is carbon neutral, you know, reducing the carbon footprint even a thing in your research when you talk to people about products? Uh, Pam, um, we are starting to see what uh, just Scott described on especially small space living. Because in a small space, regardless of the appliances, consumers have to live in freely and with healthily, and uh, they have to take care of the wellness. The air inside a small space, that air control is very important for all of us to breathe. And such as also for the appliances as well. What we cook, you can imagine you're cooking the same thing and whether you're not in a small or big uh, space, but it's more important to control the air quality, especially in, in, in apartments, in high rises, those kind of stuff. And that's what Europe is actually very uh, far ahead of this. And then I know that it's coming to the US. It will be surfacing up, it will happen. Right, because I think in Europe, they've always been concerned about air quality. They've always been concerned about sustainability and waste, particularly water conservation, right? Um, are you finding are you are you finding that, you know, clients or consumers are active looking for products that deliver on this, that conserve water, conserve energy? This is going to be uh, number one if not, and number two, the top three uh, elements when the consumers are shopping for appliances. Water conservation, especially for laundry products, especially for dishwashers, because dishwashers, as we stay home longer, because we're now working at home, eating at home, doing everything, and then we use our products more often, and I'm sure that we're, we're, gonna, use, we're gonna be using our dishwashers longer. So um, the new technology will help us to um, increase speed of motors, more efficient washing, more um, uh, hygienic washes. Also, uh, sanitization will be so much important uh, for the consumers, especially when it comes to dishwashers. Great. Um, and also, what are the products is Beko introducing in the future that answer the need to be environmentally friendly? Um, no, uh, Pam, um, uh, this is a great question. And we are so much excited about introducing a very environmentally friendly washer. Um, this washer, um, especially, we figured out, well, uh, plastic pollution, we need to answer to the plastic pollution. 
We produce all the appliances have plastic components inside, but the plastic pollution is reality. Whether it's you're in the US, whether you're in another part of the con- uh, world, um, it's going to happen and, and we have to address it. So we came up with a very good idea about um, uh, how to use um, uh, plastic bottles inside the washers. So we will be demonstrating and we will be showing off a new product that is coming into the US pretty soon that um, the tub of the washer is made of uh, with the particles that are from our everyday um, uh, plastic bottles that we throw away. And we don't think about what's what's happening once we throw away. So is that one of the uh, products you'll be introducing at KBiz? Yes, that that product will be, we have a a specific uh, section in our booth. um, So, and then we will definitely be talking about it. So um, uh, we would like, uh, also the audience know that there is ways to do and to do those uh, good with those plastic stuff that we are throwing away that pollutes all of our environment. Excellent. Thank you, Sazi. Um, so Scott, let's, let's move a little bit into about connectivity and technology. In your mind, how important is it for a kitchen appliance to be connected? Is it expected by consumers today? Um, are they mostly looking for touchless voice activation? What are your thoughts? Well, we're, we're early on into the era of connected appliances, but we're starting to see real use cases. And so some examples are remote service capabilities. I mean, it's really important if you can service, that's a picture, let, let me skip to that. That picture is showing remote operation of an appliance. So we're talking about being able to remotely operate an oven. You don't have to open the oven door to be able to see if something's bubbling or not. Uh, you could be out on the patio grilling and, oh, I need to check on, you know, what's in the oven. So you could do that from the patio. Other applications, too. So remotely operating appliances uh, is, I think, going to be one of the most important uh, new technologies. And it's one that customers are asking for, too. Uh, back to remote service. So in a remote service situation, it doesn't mean that your uh, appliance has to be connected online 24-7. You could say, I think there's something wrong with my oven. And you could then flip the switch, turn it on so it's online and let the factory diagnose it uh, remotely. And they, uh, because we're seeing more and more appliances are software as much as they are hardware these days, it could possibly be fixed online. But if not, you might have a technician come to the house and they already know what part to bring. So you're saving time and money by eliminating a service trip. Uh, Another really great use uh, case is over-the-air upgrades to appliances. We saw a major manufacturer, GE Appliances, uh, upgrade 200,000 ovens uh, within the last year to uh, offer uh, air fry capability. So, you know, we're we're, we're seeing over-the-air things in a a very early stage, but I think this is going to be really huge. So take, for example, the oven presets I talked about with cooking fish earlier. I think we're going to see uh, presets that give us a way to do things, m- multiple different cooking modes in one setting. That could come to us over the air. Uh, you know, we don't have to have a technician come and uh, give us this new capability of our appliances. So uh, I think that's a, a really uh, big, important thing. Heck. You know what, Scott, if I can start my car remotely, I want to be able to start my oven remotely. That's all I'm Yeah, gonna... right. That's yeah, right. that's right. That's exactly right. Um, and Sazi, so what do you think consumers want from these integrated programs just to run the appliance or like me, I want, do you want, do they want recipes, tips on cooking, preparing, storage ideas? What are your thoughts? Um, Pam, they want comfort. They want comfort really and, and easiness of not just the use of appliance, but they'd like to have, feel good about what, when they purchase an appliance that will actually help their um, uh, lifestyle much easier and then focus on their energy instead of doing worrying about these to their families, to their loved ones. So that's what, how, how, I, how I would see it. And, um, and, and I agree with Scott, um, connectivity is still at the infancy level. We still, uh, we're just seeing uh, just the beginning of it. The real uh, connectivity will come when all the appliances will speak each other, when we will want them to speak to each other and we can control them together. Well, all I can say is I'm, I'm sure I speak for everyone in the audience that I just want updates done without me having to worry about it. Clean my filter, do my thing. I don't want to have to even look at that manual. Um, 
So Scott, let's talk about storage and, and preparation of food. Can you describe how this has changed over the last several years and particularly during the pandemic and how it has impacted the design of kitchens? Yeah, you know, one word is uh, more, you know, more of everything, you know, more storage, more cooking, uh, more energy is consumed, uh, uh, more food is purchased. Uh, people want bigger islands and they want more seating at the islands. Uh, so all of these things are, are adding up, uh, you know, and some of the trends that, that I'm seeing, appliances are wearing out because they're getting more usage than they have. Uh, uh, small appliances are taking over our countertops. So uh, I'm expecting to see more multi-purpose uh, appliances, combinations of things, just like the oven that can broil, that can steam, uh, that can keep things warm. Uh, and uh, grocery delivery has been mentioned. I think that's a, a really big deal. Uh, it could mean uh, less buying less items uh, per order and ordering more often could help us keep things fresher. Um, for myself, I have to actually have to, I, I like checking things out at the store myself. I like to choose my own tomatoes, but um, I've also used a delivery service and, uh, you know, and a lot of times I've gotten people who are pretty, pretty good at it. So that, that works too. Good. Um, can I just tell you every day I wake up and pray that nothing breaks. None of my appliances break because no one's, I'm not going to be able to get anybody into my house for like two months. And that would be a nightmare. Um, so what about a compost bin or recycling area? I mean, you know, five years ago, maybe nobody thought about it, but are they thinking about it now? They are, they are thinking about it now. And, uh, you know, it's interesting with technology. I have just recently become aware of a company by the name of Lomi, L-O-M-I that is uh, uh, just launched. And I think they've shipped tens of thousands already. This uh, composting machine can sit on a countertop in a closet um, and it composts overnight. And, and it'll even do bioplastics. So this is a real evolution, but um, I think that a lot of people have composted uh, outdoors. Some people have composted indoors uh, in composting boxes but we're starting to see a whole lot more of this happening. Excellent. Well, I can tell you over the pandemic, I have now have a kitchen garden, which I never had before. And I think I grew two tomatoes. I'm very excited. Um, <laughs> so Hussey, what do you think the number one factor is in promoting a healthy lifestyle going forward? I mean, just all your research, everything that Becco is doing, what are your thoughts on that? Like, what is the number one thing that you feel will be the most important factor to promote this? Um, Pam, um, accessibility, um, flexibility, um, and also, um, also in coming with the uh, connected appliances, serviceability, that to make everything easy um, to do for consumer, anything that we can give the flexibility to the consumer to do more with their appliances, and we can show together, um, not just just Beko, but we can lead, of course, um, what kind of extra benefits that the consumer can have uh, to extend his, his or her health and wellness uh, and well-being um, in the environment. And addition to that, also sustainability of the product. Earlier um, uh, panelists discussed about not just the sustainability in, within the product, but it's outside the product. So how our products are being manufactured? How is it packaged? Whether it's gonna be stand, uh, recycled or not? So we have to think all about this when promoting not just the appliances features itself, but also the appliance itself as well. We have to think about down the road. What happens 15 years later when I'm done with my product? What's going to happen? So that's the mindset actually we should promote. So one of my uh, favorite questions to ask, but I know everybody hates it is, okay, so what does that kitchen look like in 10 years? Uh, Scott, I'm going to ask you first, what does that kitchen look like in 10 years? In your mind, what's in it? What are consumers asking for? What does that look like? You know, I think I could say more what the kitchen will do than what it will look like. I think we're heading towards zero waste kitchens and we might never get there, you know, 100 percent. But I think that's the compass and it's pointing towards uh, saving time, saving energy, saving food, saving water. These are all things that have a value and can be quantified. And uh, we need to start making uh, appliances. We are and we need to do more to save all these things. I think zero waste is, uh, is a great goal. Good, Sazi, you wanna add anything? Um, Scott is spot on. Mm -hmm. That's, our, that's our, our goal should be zero waste. Um, our lifestyle that will match 
that in on the appliances and what we can get out of the appliances as well. Good. Well, thank you both. I think we have a few minutes left to take some questions from the audience. So I'm gonna see what we have here. Let's see what we have. Okay, first one is for you, Scott. And I'm sure you hear this from your clients. Don't these new technologies make appliances harder to operate? How challenging is it to learn all these new features? You know, I think it's actually the opposite because technology uh, has become more complex, but lately it's actually becoming less complex. And so I'll give you an example. So in the kitchen, we all remember our, our parents or our grandparents had a little white timer. They would set the timer when they were gonna do something. So, so what you do is you walk over to the timer, you set the timer for 10 minutes. And then when the timer goes off, you go over, you get the timer, you turn the, the timer off, okay? And in the tech world, that's called, that's called friction. So now we can say, uh, hey, virtual assistant. I'm not gonna say it because then mine's gonna start talking while we're in the media. So, but you know, hey, set a timer for 10 minutes. Okay, take the timer off when it, when it starts going off 10 minutes later. So, so that idea of reduced friction is, is where we're headed. And our kitchens and our appliances, I think are gonna be more like, um, more like iPhones, you know, more like smartphones than, uh, than ever before. That's the direction that, that we wanted to go. I, I talked earlier about a range being connected to a hood vent. So these two devices talking to each other, um, you know, they're, they're using Wi-Fi to connect with each other. I'm not in the middle of that conversation that, you know, the range is telling the, the hood or could be a sensor saying ah, there's smoke, you know, or the temperature has gone up above a certain level. And so then the, the vent uh, turns on and this is automation and this is completely frictionless. So uh, the last thing I would say is uh, for folks that have concerns about tech is, you know, the redundancy is, is built in. So it's not just, um, hey, when my Wi-Fi is down, I lose the ability to do everything that I'm doing. No, that's not the case. Uh, things are being built so that you can operate them manually if the, if the Wi-Fi goes down. Uh, I'm not even going to get into the metaverse, okay? Because then we're going to get a little crazy, but I, I get exactly what you're talking about. Frictionless is the way to go. Um, so thank you, Scott. So we have time for one more question. This one is for you, Sazi. Um, I love the washer drum made from recycled water bottles. Do you think it's only a matter of time before we see a lot more kitchen appliances made from recycled materials? And why do you think we haven't seen much of this, at least here in the States until now? Um, it's being discovered, Matt, Pam. Um, we will see more and more products being produced by, um, or by byproducts or previously used materials. But more importantly, how we see is we have to produce a product that is fully recyclable down the road, down the end of its life. So that's our goal. And uh, we're proud to do this as Beko. All of our appliances have the very high, above 95% recyclability level, so that we know that in the future, when it's dumped uh, to a dumpster, it's not gonna harm the environment. Everything, all the components that we produce with, they're all recyclable already. But using recyclable byproducts into the, it's, it's gonna be increasing more. Great. And manufacturers are discovering this. It's good to know. Um, well, it looks like that's all we have time for today. Thank you, Scott and Sazi. You guys are fantastic to talk with. I wish we could go longer, um, but I'm getting the stop sign from my colleagues. They know how much I like to go on about this subject. So I will say goodbye to you both. Thank you so much. You guys are amazing. Um, and back to you, Bill. Thank you, Pam. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you, Pam. A great panel. Uh, expect nothing less. And when Scott and Sazi are involved, um, their insight and, and knowledge is, is just it's amazing, amazing stuff, guys. Thank you all for a great panel. Uh, let's start our second poll. As noted earlier, if you answer the poll, you'll be entered into a chance to win a Beko Turkish coffee maker. We'll announce the winner later in the summit. So the second poll, we'll run over a video that asks, what does a healthy kitchen mean to you? Once you answer the poll, it will leave your screen. I think a healthy kitchen is one that is designed purposefully to allow um, eco-conscious people, homeowners, families, um, to live comfortably and live a healthy, happy life. And also the equipment that goes into it really needs to help support that whole 
healthy. You know, I want, I want to do it. I want to do it quickly. I want to do it healthy. I want it to taste good. Um, and I want shopping to be easy. So storage is really important, both fresh and, and um, dry storage. I think it's a different answer for different folks. I think health and wellness um, has a lot to do with how you live, how you cook, what culture you come from. Um, those, those are things that for us as designers, we really embrace. And so it's not a boilerplate um, answer. I do think for us, health is um, all about function in a kitchen. So best ergonomics, best organization, best materials um, that serve what, what we need in the kitchen, but also serve a greater purpose, right? And that they're good for the environment, they're good for local economy. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're wanting to be supportive on all levels of kitchen design. I think a healthy kitchen is one that enables people to uh, live in their home as long as possible. And that would include being able to use technology to their advantage. Kitchens are the biggest work zone in the home. And by enabling technology, we're gonna reduce labor so we all can enjoy our time, especially social time, and that makes for a healthy kitchen. So poll number two asks, who do you trust most when considering a new appliance or technology purchase, an appliance dealer or retailer, a family or friend, an influencer or media source, or no one, you just trust yourself. Okay, coming in number one is an appliance dealer or retailer. Well, that's excellent news and, and a great uh, source for NKBA members uh, for everyone to go and, and get guided on the best products to purchase for what your projects, you know, what you're trying to do. Next up, we have how food and recipe prep can drive healthy kitchen design featuring a trio of respected food experts, including Bridget Boucher, professional chef and appliance authority, who will be our moderator today for the following panelists. Melanie Marcus, MARD, nutrition and health communications manager from Dole Food Company and member of the Becco Healthy Kitchen Council. And Icicle or Ice Sanford, recipe developer and food photographer, foolproof living, and member of the Becco Healthy Kitchen Council. For this session, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and direct them to any one of our panelists who will review them and answer them within the next couple of weeks. So Bridget, let me turn it over to you. Fantastic, thank you, Bill. Hi. Uh, it's so wonderful to be here um, to gather and talk today about um, design and health and wellness in our modern kitchens. Um, our kitchens are just of such great importance to us in our lives, and they represent a really intentional, life-changing investment. And um, so with that said, um, I'll start with um, Melanie, um, you know, in your expert perspectives, both of you um, looking at the future in designing nutrient dense, healthy kitchens. Um, what are your inspirations and where are they coming from? Sure, I can start, happy to. Thanks for having me today. Um, for us at Dole, we're creating recipes for the busy mom, um, you know, parents providing healthy meals for families. They're trying to live that healthy lifestyle. They know that feeding um, families at home is, is really healthier and more affordable, but they're limited on time and constantly multitasking. The other person we keep in mind is that new cook. I always think of this person as, you know, a young person, but really learning to cook and live healthy, you know, anyone can be inspired at any age. So really can be anyone, but you know, this person could be living at home for the first or leaving um, and living on their own for the first time. 
Maybe they're not sure to start with healthy cooking. They may tend to over buy produce and pack those produce drawers in the refrigerator. Um, they're learning how to meal plan and they can easily get discouraged with that cost of food and cleanup. So, you know, at Dole, we're trying to eliminate these pain points. We're trying to develop recipes in minds based on dietary restriction and need to. So maybe low sodium, low fat, um, vegan um, lifestyles. Um, we're just keeping all of these things in mind. Mind. That's great. Thank you. Ice? Uh, for me, when I write about uh, food and recipes, I think about who I call Jennifer. She's my avatar. She's a well-traveled middle-aged person looking to alter her lifestyle to be healthier. She's interested in trying new things, experiencing new cultures. She enjoys cooking, but she doesn't have a lot of time like most of us. Uh, she's uh, looking uh, for easier recipes, perhaps even uh, from various different cultures uh, like Mexican or like me, Turkish, uh, that she can make without spending hours in the kitchen. Uh, she also understands the value of good quality ingredients and is willing to pay for them. Um, and her understanding, like it is mine, of a healthy kitchen is a place where she feels inspired to cook and have the resources at her fingertips. It's fantastic. I can see all of them in their perspective kitchens. Um, so what are some strategies to consider when discussing nutrition and recipes, um, as well as meal prep, like in a healthy kitchen and a sustainable kitchen design? I think, you know, with, uh, with the pandemic, uh, the health is the new wealth, right? We heard that over and over again. It's really cool to be healthy right now. Um, and I think for me, there are like two things, like you said, meal prep is a very important part of the thing, whether it is like cooking a batch of quinoa to use in salads or bowls throughout the week, or freezing some vegetables like I did here with uh, peas or um, just organize things like freezing vegetables, like I said, chopping things up um, so that you can organize your meals around throughout the week. Also have some go-to basic recipes. Uh, they, they instill confidence, establish some go-to um, resources for those recipes. To me, that kind of an increased uh, popularity and need of all this cooking requires a kitchen that I can organize better. And I want to be able to find things that I'm looking for with ease as quickly as possible. I also want my kitchen kitchen and tools to work for me with say, like ample counter space and appliances that uh, use the latest technology and overall create a place where I have good time cooking. Melody? Yes. So for me, I think sustainability really wins when we can efficiently meal prep and meal plan really well. And everyone is at a different stage of efficiency and learning when it comes to that. So, you know, you as designers and builders could ask your clients, you know, are they meal preppers or do they aspire to be? Um, do they aspire to create freezer meals and cook for one or two days during the month and stock up those meals and then pull them out one at a time? as needed? Um, or how many meals a week do they plan to cook at home? Where do they shop? Are they shopping at the local farmer's market or are they doing online shopping? Do they live a plant-based lifestyle? Are they vegan or vegetarian? All of these things for me translate into how much counter space or perhaps built-in stools, you know, do they need that for kids? Um, placement of appliances, how much freezer space or refrigerator space do they need? Um, do they need a produce sink or a composter? They were talking about that in the previous session. All of these things are really important to discuss with clients so that nutrition can really be at the center of the design. Super smart. And boy, there's nothing better than a pre-prep meal after a busy day. And you take that out of the freezer and you're ready to go. It's, it's a great way to eat healthy. Um, so on that notion, you know, what is the, the role of food and now vitamin preservation and the reduction of waste um, in a healthy kitchen movement, as y'all are um, referring to a lot of these parts that make it easy? I think, uh, you know, we talked about meal prepping and, you know, uh, having access to food and all. 
Um, back in the day before uh, the pandemic, when I was sharing recipes, it was all about just like the recipe itself. You know, you uh, saute vegetables and do this. And, you know, these are the steps. Nowadays, people are uh, looking for more of the how do I say for this example, like in this example, for an asparagus recipe that I'm going to make on Saturday, if I go to the store on Wednesday, how can I store it? Or if it's like, say, I want to make something with uh, butternut squash, how can I uh, chop it up? People are looking for those kinds of information right now so that they can get the most out of the ingredients that they're buying to make uh, these recipes at home. So uh, for us content creators, we're going back to basics and providing step-by-step -step information, uh, not only how to make the uh, vegetable or these meals, but also how to store and um, increase get increased longevity uh, from these uh, ingredients. Also, like these kinds of ever fresh, harvest fresh technology that Beko offers are just super helpful. That way, we can go to the store once a week and get the most out of our um, you know ingredients for food. Melanie, yes. So, I think in general, people that are interested in health and sustainability are naturally using more fruits and vegetables every day, and they're trying to get the most out of their food. So one example that I always think of is my grandmother, my babja. She used everything. So if she was roasting a turkey, um, we knew that we were having like a turkey barley soup the next day because she would carve the turkey. She would take that carcass and she would put it straight into a pot and start, you know, starting that broth going. And then if we didn't eat all of the turkey in that, you know, evening or day, then we transitioned and we did like a, a turkey or a, a chicken salad or something, you know, the following day with it. So there was always a plan to get the most out of that. And I think consumers want to get the most out of their whole fresh unprocessed food. And this goes hand in hand with sustainability. Other examples are pickling vegetables, freezing spinach greens, if they won't be eaten, um, storing produce correctly, like the asparagus or even, you know, the composting. I think all of that comes into play. Great advice. I can smell the broth from here. <laughs> <laughs> it's really entertaining. Uh, so um, if we're looking at some tangible things that designers can do with kitchens um, to encourage healthy eating and um, a more sustainable living, uh, what, would, what would you suggest? So I've been writing my blog, foolproofliving.com, for nine years. And every year, closer to the holidays, I send a survey to my readers. And there's always that one same question. What is your number one problem when it comes to cooking, like what is your pain point? And up until 2020, mid 2020, it was always like, I don't have enough time. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't have the resources. 2020, things change. Now it's all about, I don't have enough space. My kitchen is not organized. Um, I think when it comes to good kitchen design that encourages people to cook, good counter space is a game changer. Um, whether it is like enough space near the stove, a prep area, intentional counter space near the sink, those are really uh, good things to have. Also a large pantry. Uh, we just moved into this brand new house. By the way, my kitchen looks nothing like these pictures, uh, <laughs> but we moved into this beautiful house. I have this gorgeous kitchen, big living room, big dining room, but the pantry is so small. This is where the cooking starts and my pantry is so, so small. So I want uh, I asked designers, think of this pantry space as a supermarket. When I go into the supermarket, how I am inspired to cook, that should give me uh, that uh, pantry space, give me that. And I hear this from my readers over and over again, too. It could never be big enough. Like there are not enough shoes in the planet. Right. right. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's go to um, Melanie. When designing um, kitchens for like growing families and um, getting kids involved um, in preparation, consumption of foods that are healthier, um, what do you suggest involving kids and you know how that plays into design? Since my daughter could stand, she's observed me cooking in the kitchen and, you know, I give her age appropriate tasks. So whether she's measuring ingredients or washing and tearing lettuce, 
mashing breadcrumbs or bananas for muffins. Um, for us, it's very important for her portable stool to move all around the kitchen so that she can safely participate in these tasks. Uh, we know the more children are involved in preparing foods, the more likely they are to eat them. And it can take a lot of exposure for kids to actually eat that piece of broccoli. So the more we can get them involved, the better. Most of us don't eat enough fruit and vegetables. So anything we can do to help this process is a huge win. I think designers, again, can ask questions to make it easier for families to really like congregate in the kitchen, like it's a second living room, whether it's like the pull out stools here. So it's an easy level up so that they can be on eye level or, you know, induction burners are a big one for safety. They're great for kids. And then, you know, microwave placement. Um, if too low, I think sometimes kids can operate themselves. So things to keep in mind. I love it. Yes. And the more, the, the merrier, right? Farmer's market, pick out foods, all that treats and that gets kids really active and eating well. Um, I'm going to ask you, Melanie, um, since we're on uh, families and topics, um, can you share with us um, some details about um, Beko and Dole and their strategic alliance and um, what's happening there? Yes. So partnering with Beko is really just a natural fit for us at Dole. Um, we have a long-term mission to improve the health of Americans by making healthy eating easy and fun. And the number one way to do that is by including more produce in the diet. So we're partnering with Beko because nutrition, recipe preparation, food, you know, produce and vitamin uh, preservation, all of that needs to be at the conversation, you know, around the healthy kitchen. So our partnership will have a little bit of everything, um, some blogger partnerships, promotions, even some charitable um, giveaways. Maybe we'll see some refrigerators stocked with dull produce out there. Um, we're really excited about the next couple of years. How amazing. Ooh, that sounds great. I'd like to receive one of those refrigerators. That sounds fabulous. Um, we have a, a minute for um, ice. Maybe you could talk quickly about um, the, um, you know, the role that um, recipes are playing in the kitchen and what does that look like? And, um, and tell us a, a little bit about that in kitchen design. Yeah, there are a couple of things you can do. I think as we talked about meal prep, plan your meals and plan your kitchen around your meals or plan, uh, organize your kitchen around those meal preps. Put things in places where it's easy to find. Uh, build yourself a library of recipes where it is just like a simple salad dressing that you can use over, over and over again. Uh, or like a basic green salad recipe that you can just recreate with whatever is in the season. And... Uh, take these recipes as a place to start and make it your own um, around your family's needs and what you have in your fridge. So those would be the things that I would recommend. Boy, those are inspiring, beautiful pictures. That's so great. There's nothing better than a fresh salad. So really cool tips. That's great. Well, um, this has sure been just such a wonderful and informative um, session. It's been fast paced. It went so quick. I thought we could hang out and talk forever. Um, but really great perspectives. I have so much respect for both of your work. And um, it's just been wonderful to learn more about a modern kitchen. And so um, this is just, few, you know, wonderful. It's great food for thought for future kitchens and kitchens current. Um, so thanks. And uh, I'll hand it back to Bill. Those, those pictures were making me hungry. Uh, yeah, right? I don't know. It's that mid-afternoon feeling. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bridget and Melanie and Ice for, for great insight and information. We really appreciate you sharing that uh, with the audience. Just a reminder for everyone, if you have questions for this last session, please put them in the chat and direct them to any one of our panelists. They will review them and answer within the next couple of weeks. Definitely, uh, the summit is just flying by. It's time to announce our next winner. Congratulations to David Matthews of Churchill Construction, who just won a Beko Turkish coffee maker. Congratulations, David. Enjoy that. It looks like we are down to our second to the last session, sustainability in the kitchen, something that's not only important to our summit partner, Beko, but also me personally. I had a chance to reintroduce my good friend, Zach Elkin, president of Beko USA, who is a passionate believer in the healthy planet and the moderator of our next panel. Hello again, Zach, and 
I know you'll have a lot of fun with this next discussion. Oh, I think we lost your audio, Zach. Uh, maybe you. I'm on mute. Not there anymore. we go. Can you, hey, listen, you, it's, you can never have a <laughs> summit without saying that. Right. That's exactly right. Right. Well, okay, uh, it's, exactly. it's great to see everyone again. And uh, we're going to have a very fast and furious 15 minutes. We have two very established, very distinct designers, one from the great state of Oklahoma, Lynn Knight Jesse, and Hi. another, Molly McCabe, from uh, Seattle, Washington area, out on one of the <laughs> islands there. Uh, so, ladies, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to join us. Uh, for what's going to be the fastest 15 minutes, if you will, in sustainability <laughs> in the kitchen. So let's go have some fun. Thank uh, you. I'm going to kick it off uh, real quick. So, uh, you know, what is the role of sustainability in the kitchen from your all's perspective? And has it moved from an afterthought to intentional? And I, I'd like to see the contrast here. So uh, why don't we start with you, Lynn, because I know Oklahoma is a little bit different. Go ahead. Yes, I'm from Oklahoma, and it is a little bit different. We're just now getting into sustainability, but it's wonderful to be able to be on the forefront of this and talk to your clients about what really matters in the kitchen. Uh, it's become one of our top five questions that we get answered. You know, we get asked as we're preparing with our clients. Um, you know, they want to know about the preserving of food. They want to know about aging in place. And honestly, those two items are huge in our industry right now. So when it comes to sustainability, I think it's very important that we visit with our clients, we talk with our clients, we listen to their needs, and then we come back and build their kitchen, not our kitchen, around sustainability and their aging progress. Thanks, Lynn. Molly, I know uh, it's uh, been a big part of uh, your uh uh, designed for quite some time. So uh, your perspective coming from the great state of Washington. Well, what's surprising is the number of kitchens that are remodeled every year. It, it, and the average kitchen is actually remodeled every 10 years. Sometimes it has to do with aesthetic preferences, but more often than not, it has to do with the fact that the materials have worn out and are literally falling apart. Cabinets, countertops, uh, appliances. And so um, sending all these materials to a landfill is both sad and unnecessary. Um, so our mantra is to reduce, reuse, recycle, and repurpose. The mirror in this bathroom is, uh, was cut, was first of all, it was um, taken off another job site and it was cut to, with the template from the countertop. So here's a piece of recycled material. In this bathroom, um, this was designed for a person with chemical sensitivity. So there's uh, no particle board, no added urea formaldehyde. The materials are easy to clean. They don't require toxic cleaning uh, solutions um, as does the floor. And the paints were low VOC. Um, in this kitchen or in this laundry room, I should say, are recycled cabinets off of another project if you notice the laundry soap up on the left-hand corner, that was actually a microwave shelf originally. Wow, so uh, quite a bit there, keep going. And these are repurposed also. The vanities, the plumbing fixtures, the, um, the decorative hardware, uh, all of that was repurposed from another, another project. I know that uh, one of my favorite quotes that uh, Molly uh, gave me uh, some time ago is, you know, we have to quit taking it out and throwing it out. And as you can see from what she just walked through, she doesn't do that. There's a lot of recycling going on there. Thank you, Molly. So as you think about this, ladies, what kitchen designers think about when incorpor incorporating sustainability in their design? Uh, Molly, why don't you go first? Recommending products that are durable with minimal maintenance requirements is, I think, the most important criteria. The more durable the product is, the less um, maintenance required it has and the less often it will need to be replaced and end up in a landfill. Incorporating accessible design features in every product is equally important from a sustainability standpoint because it negates the need to remodel again when an individual's circumstances change. Um, 
you never know what's going to happen. You can have an accident, other things can happen and, and planning ahead and um, using materials judiciously is important. Uh, in the kitchen photos that you see now, this kitchen was um, designed with sustainability in mind. The walls are made of clay, they breathe. Um, they're great for uh, monitoring humidity. An exhaust fan is, uh, is been sized to, to the space and to the cooking equipment. The cabinetry is all FSC certified plywood boxes with no added urea formaldehyde uh, substrates on the drawers and doors, cork flooring, um, and locally produced tile. So. Yeah, you brought up formaldehyde a couple of times here. So, I mean, off gassing is a real issue, isn't it? Yes. Um, yeah. I think it's, you know, I don't want to breathe this stuff, and I don't think it's um, in, I don't think it's fair that I should subject the people who work for us to be sub, to um, be subjected to it either. And I don't think our clients want it. Sure. So that's why we have a all plywood po um, policy. Lynn, how about down there in uh, the great state of Oklahoma? And I know you also get into the state of Texas there too. But you know what? You know what? What are you? What should kitchen designers be thinking about as far as incorporating sustainability? I mean, what are you seeing? Well, <clears throat> I think I think I've always uh, been a sustainable designer and didn't even know what I was doing, to be quite honest with you, because we this kitchen that you're looking at right now is probably a 15 year old kitchen. And we have uh, always used a cabinetry that has the least amount of formaldehyde in it. It's all wood. We put a lifetime warranty on our cabinetry. So that's very good sustainability for our clients. Um, we try to use products like that back wall is all uh, a glass product. It's been a recycled glass product. And um, what I like about what we're doing is if you look at them, these are old kitchens. These, this isn't something that we've just done recently when this has all become to the forefront. So I think uh, just design something that is going to be there for a long time and it's not going to be out of style in the next year or two, that it's going to be something that lasts forever. In this particular one, we've used a metal backsplash, and uh, we also designed this whole addition onto the house that we allowed a lot of lighting to get into the room, natural lighting, and then other uh, lighting besides, sustainable, besides their decorative lighting. This is the same kitchen, again, that shows the granite countertops. And this is about a five-year-old kitchen. So uh, I think designing simplicity, my motto is KISS, keep it simple, stupid, and go from that direction of making something that lasts a lifetime. All those kitchens are, are just beautiful, Molly and, and, and Lynn, both of you. So uh, thanks for sharing those with us. You know, sustainability, I mean, you know, what's covered by sustainability? It's, 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 you know, it's a real big word, but it means a lot of different, it means different things to different people. Uh, it's not just appliances and services and paints and, and furniture. So, I mean, Molly, why don't you take the first stab at that? I know, I know smart design is sustainable design, but Molly, what, from your perspective, what, 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 what does sustainability mean to that homeowner that you're working with? It means a lot of different things. Um, I think, well, let me, let me back up a minute. We incorporate sustainable principles and materials in every job that we do, and we kind of do it seamlessly. We don't really talk about it as much um, with the client. So we make sustainable behavior easy for the client. So whether it's recycling bins or compost buckets, um, how to use your uh, ventilation system to maintain your indoor air quality. In the photo up right now, if you look up on the top right, uh, portion of the photo, you see a mini split, but on either side of the, the mini split is the vents for the HRV, a heat recovery ventilator. The cooktop in the island has a downdraft system with it. And that downdraft system is active when it's put into use, activates the HRV, which then draws air out, which then um, addresses the makeup air component that is required by code in our jurisdiction. Make it easy. They don't have to do two things. They don't have to remember. It just happens for them. That's exceptional. And 
And Lynn, from your perspective, I know we talked about accessibility in the past uh, along this same conversation as sustainability, but sustainability also is accessibility, right? As That's far exactly as the way you build. Right. Yes, and when we're designing something, we really do try to design it for someone that's going to stay there. Whether they're reselling their property or not, we want it to be someplace where someone can age in place. So we do a lot of things like making all of our doors and everything wheelchair accessible. Um, my biggest thing is designing kitchens that the family can be in, not just one person, but the whole family. So I'm very conscious about how much workspace we put around the cabinets and around the island. And um, they were talking about all the appliances that we have anymore. We design a lot of islands that have large drawers in them so that you can easy, easily pull the appliance out, plug it in and work it right at one place without having to store it somewhere and run around. Uh, it's just so much easier to make everything accessible for the homeowner. Time is precious to all of us. We just don't have it. So I think the more you make things accessible and easy and make the kitchen an enjoyable place to be, not some place you have to work. Yeah, very good, very good uh, thought there. Molly, I know I've heard you say over, over conversations we've had that you, you say form follows function. Could you kind of expound on that a little bit for the, for the group here today? I'd be happy to. When a space is functional, it exudes its own beauty. And everybody feels better when they're in a beautiful space. But when you think about workflow, um, it, this is a subject that's been touched on earlier today. Put things in a convenient place. Make it easy. You know, especially with some of our senior uh, clients, they're gonna have better nutrition if it's easier for them to cook because they're gonna be more motivated to cook. And I'm very concerned about their health and their welfare. So ease of movement through the room, um, it, it just kind of gives you a peaceful sense of serenity when, when a space is well thought through. Absolutely. And, and Lynn, you, I know you've talked from time to time about some of the new emerging products that you're using now, the compost bins, and things like that from a sustainability standpoint? Yes, we uh, our company now has a compost bin that's built in, which we we're real excited about that. That was just presented to us this year at the first of the year. So we're real excited about that. And uh, because composting waste is just, of all the natural gases that are given off, half of the food that we throw away uh, causes half of that. So it's a big thing, you know. We throw away so much food. And so this preservation and these refrigerators that are now coming out with 30 day um, preservation for food, that's wonderful for me because I buy food once every two weeks and I want it to last a while, you know? So uh, all the appliances and everything that are helping me fast for that, I think are wonderful. Well, I didn't know if you had a comment or not about the, the, the food preservation or not. That up there in the Pacific Northwest, do you see anything from a trend perspective uh, that's uh, becoming bigger or has it already been a big uh, issue in, in that particular market? I think it's gotten bigger. I think more people are buying more organic product and they're investing a lot of money in, in this produce and, and other foods and they want, it, they want it to last longer. So they're putting more attention on the purchase of refrigeration than they ever have before. And so, when you have that preservation, there's so many benefits. It's time saved, it's money saved, it's carbon footprint reduce, reduction. There's so many benefits to having good refrigeration. Not only the technologies that are coming out with refrigeration, but the also you also have to remember the lighting. If you can't see what's in your refrigerator, you're producing science experiments and that's obviously a waste of food. <laughs> I love that comment. So. You know, sustainability is a big part of what we, we do and we believe in, and, and you all do too. So, you know, I guess, do you see your consumers paying attention to sustainability uh, with the appliances or, or with cabinets or with countertops these days? Uh, are they making the selection just on the look, the feel, the design, or is, does the sustainability actually enter into that conversation? I guess, uh, I, guess I would, uh, you know, go with you, Molly, first. Uh, what, what, what do you feel? 
Well, first of all, when we have a first meeting with a client, they're required to fill out a questionnaire. One of the questions is the question in the questionnaire is how interested are you in sustainability? So that helps us gauge what they're interested in. More people are more interested than they used to be. There's no question about it. But again, I think it's just about putting sustainable uh, principles and, and materials in front of people and letting them bite. You know, it, it just makes a lot of it makes a lot of sense in so many ways. And if it's sustainable, and if they realize it's sustainable, then it's a win-win. Lynn, how about you down in the great state of Oklahoma? Well, I don't think I've really sat down with a client and said, do you want a sustainable kitchen? But I think that what we do do is we offer sustainable products as our main course. So um, they really don't have an option as far as knowing whether it's sustainable or not. And our big thing is just to educate them, you know, tell them what it's about, um, tell them how long it's gonna last, tell them how it functions. Uh, I just think it's very, very important that all of them have the opportunity to have a kitchen that's going to last a long time. I think it's a designer's responsibility. We're just in a fiduciary situation that we need to educate our client on absolutely everything. And because in Oklahoma, you know, sustainability is almost like a political issue instead of a health issue. So <laughs> I hate to say that, but it's the truth. And um, so again, you have to get it off the table. It's not a political issue. It is a lifetime change, a lifetime way of living. It's healthy for your family. It's how you breathe. It's how you live. It's how you function. One of the things that we've been doing with our kitchens is we, get, we threw away the triangle years ago, coming from a designer standpoint instead of a uh, kitchen designer standpoint. We have workstations, we have the prep area, we have the cleanup area, we have the cooking area. So we can get a whole bunch of people in the kitchen doing things at the same time. And that's, our clients love it. Well, you, you ladies have to, first of all, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedules to talk about sustainable design in the kitchen. You know, this is a conversation that probably needs hours, not just a few minutes. So I'm looking forward to continuing this conversation with you as we, uh, as we continue our journey. Uh, also looking forward to seeing you all soon. So I think we're almost out of time. So I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, what a great discussion, great visuals, very impressive, especially the kitchens that both of you were presenting and not kitchens that were just done recently, but kitchens that were done a year, even a decade ago. So you know, sustainable design is clearly in your DNA. And I can't thank you enough for taking time again to join us today and, and also for being part of the Beco Healthy Kitchen Council. So Bill, back to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank Zach. You. And, and thank you so much, thank Linda. You. Sorry, Linda Molly, thank you for, for being part of today. I, it made me want to jump into the conversation because um, you, you shared some great images and uh, conversation. For those uh, are are passionate about sustainability, don't miss the 2022 NKBA Renovation Angel Luxury Kitchen Recycling Awards at KBiz on February 9th at 11.30 a.m. On the, on the next stage. I actually uh, recycled my kitchen for our last project and it was so simple. I don't know why everybody's not doing it. So if you don't know about Renovation Angel, you know, come check out the awards um, at, on the KBiz next stage. Okay, our last poll of the day will run again over a video that asks, what does a healthy kitchen mean to you? Remember, if you enter the poll, you have a chance to win a Beko Turkish coffee maker and also one of the five prize packs that we'll be giving away at the end of the summit. And you do have to be present to win. I think a healthy kitchen is a, a place where you feel inspired to cook, where you uh, can create memories. Yeah, I understand that, you know, the definition of healthy is different for everyone. Um, if I am making, yeah, maybe like making a chocolate cake might not be the most healthiest thing, but if I'm making it for my family and we're all eating it together afterwards, um, to me that is healthy. Um, if I'm feeling inspired and excited about cooking and, um, and just you know, sharing with my family, that to me is healthy.
I think a healthy kitchen is, like I said, makes the easy choice the right choice or makes the right choice the easy choice um, frequently. So like fruits and vegetables are within reach. This is what research shows us time and time again. Fruits and vegetables, when they're in within sight, within reach, they are chosen more frequently. So how do we do that in the kitchen? Is it on the counter? Is it on the kitchen table, in the pantry? What is at eye level? What can children reach? In the refrigerator, what can be seen? These are the things time and time again when they're in clear containers, when you can see the color, um, when they're easy to get, that is what is chosen. Whether it's a fruit or whether it's a junk food, but we want it to be the fruit, so how do we, how do we make that happen? I think a healthy kitchen is one that facilitates uh, not just cooking, but also community for people of all abilities and all skill levels. It's about encouraging people to eat healthfully because it's easy with the equipment that is provided in the kitchen. Okay, poll number three. If you're designing a new kitchen for yourself, how important would sustainability be for your design? Very important. It would impact every decision. Fairly important. When given the choice, I would always opt for the most sustainable, occasionally important or not important at all. So it looks like it's pretty much a tight race between very important and fairly important. So definitely on the minds of those of us at think about this uh, design and, and what is most important to us uh, in planning a project or space for our families. On to our last session of the day, which takes us on a journey of discovery, design, and personal vision for the future of kitchen design. It's a fascinating discussion about how one man's goal to bring, uh, build a beautiful, eco-friendly, and multi-generational house is being realized. I'd like to now bring back Pam McNally, and KBA's VP of Marketing, who will moderate this session called The Healthy Kitchen of the Future. Okay, Pam, back to you. Thank you, Bill. Super excited about our next discussion because it really looks into the future of kitchen design, which shouldn't be surprising as the project is a personal vision for tech executive Mike Wan, chief strategy author of Super League Gaming, who worked closely with Vashali Makim, principal of Makim Architecture. Mike, first of all, what is the temperature there in California right now? That's what I want to know. Mike. Let me unmute here. Hey, can oh. you hear me now? Yes. What is the temperature there? Uh, you know, it's a uh, it's a balmy 50s and <laughs> it's, uh, it's starting to creep up. So um, it's going to be a gorgeous day today. Thanks for asking. Well, well, I'm asking because here it's like 20 degrees and I hate you. I'm joking. Um, <laughs> I'm joking. And we're supposed to have a snowstorm tomorrow. So anyways, um, so, you know, look, we're, we're here to talk about and hopefully see this amazing house you're building, right? That meets your energy neutral goal and enables you to live a healthy style within its walls. So how did this idea start? Yeah, great question. You know, I've been living here in LA now and specifically Santa Monica the last 15 years. We fell in love with it once we moved down here from Seattle. And what is most interesting is, you know, as we, as we realize, you know, like the, the area in which we live in and also the commitment that, you know, in Southern California, there's a, there's a sort of focus on sustainability and, and quality of living. We realize that it'd be a good thing for us to sort of kind of put our money where our mouth is, especially when it comes to building, like, you know, putting down our roots for a forever home. And in doing so, you know, what we decided to do is, you know, really think about where we want to go, how we want to think about using the, you know, the real estate in a, in a uh, thoughtful and sustainable fashion. Um, and this went from, I mean, took everything ranging from, you know, um, usage of materials to the quality of the, uh, the design to ensure that we're, we're really maximizing, you know, the use of, you know, quality, uh, what is the best way to put it, to provide for us a good energy usage, good water efficiency, and, you know, give, a, give us a chance to really sort of build our own home to also, you know, grow our own food and really be able to sort of practice what we preach. 
So you, um, I believe your parents, it's a multi-generational homes. So you have your young family, you have your parents, you have two kitchens. Mm-hmm. How did everybody contribute to this? The thoughts, the design, how were they involved? You know, uh, the most important thing for all of us was really to build out a uh, super flexible living space. My parents are still, you know, fairly, uh, you know, still fairly independent living in Alhambra. My mother-in-law lives in Seattle and spends half her time here in uh, here in Santa Monica with us. Um, the, you know, what we wanted to do is make sure that, you know, when they came and stayed with us, they had their own space, but also getting a chance to, uh, you know, have the environment be a place where the kids can run upstairs and downstairs, spend time together. And the key here for us is really getting a chance for, you know, our our parents, so sort of the older generation, to be, to be able to see our children grow. Um, and also for us to be able to spend time together as a family, as you know, uh, you know, being a first generation immigrant, uh, you know, for us, culturally speaking, food is uh, paramount in our, um, our day to day. Chinese New Year's is coming up starting this weekend. And you know, the conversations around the family is around when are we getting together and wh- what are we going to cook together? And it's a, uh, you know, it's a, uh, it's something that's, you know, within our, within our lifeblood. And it was a part of the consideration when it came to building this, uh, you know, this building. So let me ask you this. Your parents are from Taiwan, correct? They were farmers. Yep. What did yep. they think about the design direction? It looks pretty modern, pretty futuristic. What did they think about this design direction? <laughs> the first question my mom asked, you know, when we said, hey, we're building, we're building this building, you know, uh, on, our, on our plot. Her very first question is, where's my garden going to go? Right. You know, uh, where this location previously is, you know, this is um, it's a great picture of, you know, the, uh, the multiple plots of, um, you know, uh, of gardening that we were doing, we were very much living about half, you know, over half of our vegetables were coming in from our own garden throughout the year. And our, li- our little guys are a part of the, you know, the organic farming techniques. They're learning about the three sisters methods that the Indians were doing. And now uh, a lot of this came from, you know, my mom, who is a, uh, you know, a green thumb in the family, really being able to share with everybody, like, you know, here's how you grow your own food. Here's how you, you really connect with the earth. And here's how you can be a part of, you know, uh, sustainability by, by practicing, right? Not, and not just preaching. So Vashal, right, I'm going to jump right to the challenge of how in the heck did you get a rooftop garden to sit on top of the house? And oh, I'm sure there was multiple challenges that were involved in that. Yes, for sure. I mean, uh, it's an engineering, you know, it's a, it needs engineering as well as it needs a design vision for the, for the rooftop. I mean, when Mike said that we're going to build in the back of the house, back of the lot, we realized that the whole beautiful garden was going to be gone. And so I, I, I suggested to, to Mike and Tara, let's, let's bring the garden to the roof. And that, that's, both of them loved the idea and that resulted in a large roof deck that basically is the whole footprint of the house. And then we had to accommodate a few other things on the roof, but with that, we, we have given the maximum amount of, you know, um, square footage to the garden. And, and I, think, I think they're gonna really love it and they're gonna really enjoy it. Yeah, Pam, you have to. to <laughs> That'll be a reason to, an excuse to go up to the roof, which, you know, a lot of times people forget that they have a roof deck. So Pam, you have to realize, I mean, I gave Vishali an impossible task, right? I wanted to be energy neutral, which meant that I need a huge amount of solar. And at the right. same time, right, I said, I need a garden. So in that particular case, where you're, you're fighting two completely counterintuitive, like, you know, points. And Vishali was able to, you know, constructively help us think through technology solutions. I mean, we're working with, you know, uh, Costa Sardakis of our KLM development as well as, you know, Vishali thinking about using something like a, a smart flower, which allows us to have, you know, reclaim our foot, our real estate back up on, on the roof deck and still have enough energy to be able to uh, deliver the, uh, you know, the, the energy neutral sort of mandate that I had set for ourselves. So, Mike, why am I not surprised that you gave her an impossible task and that she actually was able to deliver? So, Vashali, why don't you talk a little bit about the smart flower? I don't know if people understand what that is as an alternative to solar panels. Yeah, um, smart flower is basically um, solar panels that are shaped in, in, in a petal form. And then they're kind of arranged around a central piece that then that whole contraption moves with the sun. And this is actually very, very 
perfect. I mean, it's the, the, just the right way to think about solar panels because a lot of times people install solar panels, but they're not facing the right direction and they don't really, you know, are not very effective. But this particular element, the smart flower is so intuitive because it works with the sun and it's a, it's a, it's a kinetic sort of an element. So at night it closes and then it becomes like a sort of, you know, it doesn't have any, any uh, exposure. So it kind of closes itself which is really, really amazing. And, and Mike found this smart flower. And then when we were discussing the layout of the solar panels and, and when he found this, this was just the right way to go. And then convincing the city of Santa Monica was another task, but they, they were open to it. And so we are, a, I think we're gonna be one of the few residential projects that is gonna have this smart flower on a rooftop, which is really gonna be uh, something to look forward to. I was going to ask you how you did that, because I, got, I mean, we all know that the restrictions in California, the zoning is incredibly hard. Um, and how in the heck did you get them to OK that on your roof? I she's think a I, magic. Yeah, she's <laughs> magical. I mean, I just got I just that. showed them really good renderings. And I think they saw the value of uh, of not, you know, littering the whole roof deck with panels. And, and I think they saw the value. And, um, and we kind of put it in one corner. So, you know, it's not like really very obtrusive. And so I think we were able to convince the city to go for this, you know. And, and speaking of which, Mike, let's talk about your two kitchens because I guess before, previously you weren't allowed to have two kitchens, now you are. So one, how did you get that approved? And two, Mike, also why? Why two kitchens? Well, um, so first and foremost, you know, we've always wanted two kitchens in the house because, you know, my father's a chef. Uh, he's been a chef for 40 years, uh, opened up lots of the lots of the top restaurants in the San Gabriel Valley. And, um, you know, food is a love language in, a, in our household. Um, and, you know, knowing that we're going to have a, a house in which I want him and my mom to be uh, completely happy with, like building that second kitchen was very paramount. I mean, as when, when it comes to you know, spending time uh, when the kids spend time with the grandparents. I don't know what you guys, uh, how you guys, are, how you guys are in your families, but for us, it very much is a, uh, you know, it's a time in the kitchen. It's hands on together. Um, you know, it, whether it's outside in the garden or in the kitchen, it's it's the same thing. And for us, you know, um, you know, being able to build something that has the right good flow of space was super important. And Vashali was, you know, again, like, uh, as I mentioned earlier, she was magical in, in thinking about the flexibility of a usage space, the, you know, the changes in the, uh, in the legal compliance side of things. And Vashali, I'll let you talk about how you were able to think through the, uh, the restructuring of that. Yeah, I mean, originally, uh, I mean, usually in California, if you build a single family residence, you're allowed one kitchen, you're not allowed two kitchens, but a lot of my clients would sneak in a second kitchen if they wanted a second kitchen under the radar kind of a situation. But in this case, what happened, we started with the, that we're going to do two kitchens and then the California code changed and they realized that in California, we're going to have housing shortage. So they decided to allow people to build sort of an additional home with their single family house. So in this case, we were able to convince the city that the bottom unit, which is uh, also for the multi-generational uh, living uh, will become a junior ADU and then the rest of the house is for the family. And, and the city agreed. And, and so now legally we have two units and a two, two kitchens and, and, and which gives you know, everybody exactly what they want in terms of you know, a, a, a entertainment kitchen, and an entertainment space downstairs and then a family kitchen with the you know sort of a more sort of introverted looking kitchen upstairs so it's it's really it worked out really well for mike and tara and their vision so one thing I'll, i i am still trying to struggle with is the fact that mike told you he didn't want to raise the original structure because many people would have come in and said let's just take the whole thing down and start from scratch but i believe he told you he didn't want to do that it was a bungalow um, right. that he wanted to keep. So how did you work around that? I mean, was what was that one of those expectations you needed to manage? I mean, what did you, how did you approach Yeah, I mean, both Mike and Tara and I, we've all felt like that keeping the bungalow and keeping the existing streetscape and the charm of that bungalow was really important. Um, and, and plus, you know, we wanted to keep the build to a very small footprint. So building it in the back of the, of the existing house was the right thing to do. And, and uh, we also, um, you know, felt like the house 
should be the new house should be very very contrasting to the existing bungalow we didn't want mm -hmm. to we didn't want them to compete or we didn't want them to look alike so we we, come up, we came up with a plan of making not a box because that's one thing i told mike that i'm not going to make a box i'm going to make something really beautiful and articulate but also sort of complements you know what is there already and also makes a statement of its time right because the bungalow is from 1920s while this construction is from 2022. So it has to speak of its time. And that's what I was trying to make it happen here, which I think um, the, we are yeah, very it's happy. Almost a work. century of difference. And you can right. see that it's a, it's a beautifully contrasting, but yet, you know, like, you know, fitting for the, uh, for the, for the area and the, and, and the, and the community. So. so Mike, when the house is fully realized, what do you think your favorite features are going to be? You know, uh, you know, as you can see, uh, of the house, we have two kitchens. I mean, you know, the, you know, when we when we started initially doing this planning, right, we try to figure out what it is that we wanted to use to, like, you know, to realize that space to make it really functionally functional and useful. And what became very evident, you know, as we were going down this path is we uh, we saw that, you know, we had the conversations with you know Vashali to initially qualify and look at appliances. And um, when we saw that Beko actually, you know, we started exploring globally, like what the opportunities are, what products are off the shelf. And when we saw that Beko was leading the charge in sustainability in Europe and the fact that they were, uh, you know, coming to North America and bringing all their, uh, all their products, you know, we started looking at how we can literally be able to match the numbers that I had set forth, right, around sustainability, uh, around energy usage and consumption for two kitchens down, you know, for the same amount of energy footprint as one kitchen, uh, and at the same time be able to, you know, uh, decrease my water usage and you know, matching all the requirements that I had. So when Vishali and I sat down and looked at this and and you know took a look at it, it became very evident that you know this was this lined up perfectly and it's going to be where we spend most of our time. As I mentioned earlier, you know, food is kind of the love language in uh, in the Chinese culture and and for us. You know, I think spending time in the kitchen, that's probably where we're going to be spending most of our time, either with my you know, parents downstairs or with us upstairs. Well, I got to I got to say, Mike, food is very important to my family, too, as you can probably tell. Um, but let me ask you a question. So, you know, you consider yourself a techie. Was there anybody who inspired you towards this kind of healthful, sustainable living? Or is it something that because of your parents and where they came from, um, you know, kind of you grew up with? You know. Um, for us, uh, we always grew up with, you know, you want to, you want to like live and love the land, right? I mean, the, the land gives back if you take good care of it. Um, for us, I mean, we live about 20 blocks from the water and the ability to be able to walk everywhere and to, you know, and to be able to, you know, take good care of the land that we are, we're, we're stewarding and building on was super important to us. So. So um, it looks like we are close to running out of time, but I do want to get a couple of questions in, if you don't mind, from the audience. Yeah. This one, uh, Vashali, is for you. And it actually speaks to what you were talking about, Mike. Doesn't it cost more to remodel or build a home using healthy, sustainable products and technologies? That seems to be kind of this running theme people have. Um, what do you say to that? Uh, you okay. want me to answer it first? Yeah, Vashali? Mike, why don't, why don't you go first, and then Vashali, you can follow up. You know, it's uh, it's actually not that bad nowadays. I think if you looked five or ten years ago, um, there there is are there are folks who were looking at it as specialty products. But if you take a look at what's happening now, if you look at you know uh, the the selection of what we what we looked at, the smart flower. I mean, it's commercially available. You can just place an order and you can set it up to go. You look at Beko. Um, you know, all of our appliances are now commercially available. And, you know, if you look at it from a pricing perspective, we actually were able to you know, remain under a budget uh, by, by making the selections that we did. And that was something that, you know, you know if you look, if you talk to Costa, our general contractor, he's like, 90% of people go over budget. You're still on track. You're, you're like that 10% outlier. And, you know, that's also kudos to Vishali in selecting the, the right thing. So I'll let Vishali talk about the difficulties in working with me on that. But, yeah. Was it no, I mean, I think sustainable product, I mean, uh, people have this this thing that oh sustainability is very expensive and if you if you lean towards sustainable things but even small things that you do can 
can make, you know, can make a big difference. I feel like, you know, like doing the right type of natural light. I mean, you know, if you have a good amount of natural light, you won't need to turn on like thousands of lights everywhere, you know. So those kind of little things, little shifts, I think can can make a big difference. And I don't think sustainability needs to be looked at it as like this big alien thing that that we cannot achieve, you know. And and nowadays the products are so efficient, like all the appliances are so efficient. Of, you know, plumbing fixtures are so efficient. So I think you can easily, easily get get some sustainability, you know, even if you do just basic things, you know. So I think uh, people shouldn't be afraid of sustainability. Good. So we have time. One last thing, Mike, and let me throw this at you. What should someone look for when hiring an architect or designer focused on healthy or sustainable design? What did you think of was paramount when you chose Vashali for this job? You know, you need to have somebody who is really thinking progressively and thinking globally, right? Uh, we talked to, we spoke to a lot of folks. We actually went through one iteration prior to Vishali in which, you know, it's classic architects and designers where they're like, here's what the, uh, here's what the model looks like in the ecosystem. Here's what a McMansion looks like. Here's how you should think about building this because it's a, it's a cost-effective build. But if you look at somebody who really understands sort of where, the, where, the, where the world is headed, right? Michelle's background is very international. She has experiences in looking at, you know, where the rest of the world is also evolving. And in looking at that uh, and somebody who can look, look at it and be willing to, to sort of call you on your you know, BS and, and also be able to sort of set you right on the right path and be able to invest the time into it. That's the most important thing. Well, you probably picked the right uh, architect with Vaishali for that. She would definitely call you out. Um, and Vaishali, <laughs> would you like to add anything? No, I mean, Mike and Tara have been like, have I'm, I'm just, I'm so thankful to them for believing in me and for, and for letting me, you know, take a stab at making this, you know, bringing their vision to life. So I'm very grateful to them and grateful to you for organizing this. Yeah, this thanks for the opportunity to tell the yeah. story. Well, you tell guys them. are... Amazing. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for now. Um, but thank you, Mike, for sharing your personal story. And thank you, Vashali, for being so open about the work. I'm just hoping they allow us to return, guys. So we, after you completed the project, so we can see it in person, you can do a walkthrough. Um, Come on over for lunch. I mean, that's my, uh, that's my hey, open offer. I'm thinking dinner. I'm thinking dinner. But OK, I'll take Maybe the lunch. both. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You. Thank you both. Thank you so much. And Bill, um, over to you for our final summit giveaways. Yeah, I, just like you said, Pam, I, Mike, we're going to have you back for something because we have to see what this finished house looks like, especially those two kitchens. Uh, you know, love that smart flower. I never heard of that. And I am excited to look it up. It's pretty cool. So let's move on to our last giveaways of the summit. First, let me announce the winner from the last poll that's taking home the Beko Turkish coffee maker. And that is Katie Cody. Congratulations, Katie. Now for the last gifts to be awarded this afternoon, the five prize packs. Remember that each of these contains nearly $500 in value, including our a copy of our luxury kitchen coffee table book, two bash tickets, two opening party tickets, both for KBiz and printouts of the Healthy Kitchen Summit recipes and the one sheet of new Beko products. So here we go. The five lucky winners are Nicole Wall, Steve Salazar, our own Peggy McGowan, congratulations, Peggy, Charles Stein, CKD, and Ann Henry. Congratulations to all of you. Uh, enjoy your prizes, especially those tickets to our best events at KBiz in Orlando. Sadly, we're coming to the end of our Healthy Kitchen Summit. I want to thank Beko USA for its partnership and support in helping our industry tackle the convergent worlds of health and wellness and kitchen design. You know, in addition to Beko, our industry has so many amazing brands that have great healthy products, brands that are passionate about sustainability and have respect for our planet in the products they create. And if you want to see them, please visit kbiz.com and register. We'd love to show everyone all these great products in Orlando. There's a super high level focus on this right now. And this subject is so important and we welcome all the brands who want to partner with NKBA to share content that drives health and wellness in our lives. Remember that this summit is in its entirety will be available on demand by the end of next week. Thank you all for being here. I hope you had as much fun as I did. And I look forward to seeing all of you at KBiz in just a couple weeks. Bye for now. <laughs>